You may be seated. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Joey. I, I really like that last. I really like that last song. That's you sang that last week. Yes, sir. And that's new to me, but I really like that last song. And they did do a great job. <laughs> Amen. Well, we continue in our journey today, and we're going to be in the Acts, the, ch the 10th chapter, so if you'll just uh, take your Bible and go ahead and open up there. Uh, if, uh, I need to ask a question while you're doing that. How many, and I'll need you to raise your hand, how many of you are Gentiles? <laughs> You'd think I'd called you a curse word or something, you know what I mean? No. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, right? In, in, the, in the, the, the terminology of the Bible and, and of the first century church, if, you weren't a, if you're not a Jew, then you're classified as a Gentile. It's not a nasty word. It's, you know, it's just you, you're either a Jew or a Gentile. It, it's uh, uh, like, uh, you know, there are really only two kind of people in the world today, the saved and the lost. And, and so... You're either saved or you're lost. And uh, you, you can't be in between, but you've got to be one or the other. So if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Now last week, Pastor Steve carried us through uh, the, the wonderful uh, experience that Saul had on the road to Damascus when he got saved. And what a dramatic experience that was for him. And uh, so we looked at that, and, and Brother Steve so strongly I talked about us having a Damascus Road experience in our own hearts. And so today as we take up, and I don't want to just cut off abruptly what's going on in Saul's life. He still calls Saul, by the way. His name has not been referred to as Paul yet. I don't think that happened until like the 19th chapter of Acts, somewhere along there. And so he's still being called Saul. He's in Damascus. He'd just been saved. And he was causing all kind of ruckus in Damascus. Uh, and, and the only thing he was preaching in Damascus is just a simple message. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Lord. Uh, he is the Son of God. That, that was his simple message. Uh, but it created a lot of problems, and the Jews there decided uh, they just do away with him. Uh, so you remember, uh, they got word of it, and they, uh, some of his friends... Uh, because the, the Jews were waiting for him at all the gates of the city. You remember they lowered him down in a basket uh, over the wall, and he, he escaped and uh, went on down to Jerusalem. Of course, you remember, he had a pretty bad reputation down in Jerusalem among the Christians, and they didn't want to receive him at all. But uh, finally, Barnabas sort of interceded for him and helped him to get acquainted with the other apostles and the Christians in Jerusalem. And lo and behold, uh, uh, they were Jews there that were ready to kill him because he was preaching the same thing. One of them now that had become a Christian, and so they're trying to kill him. Uh, so everywhere he goes, it seems like they're trying to kill Saul. So he, he, he uh, <clears throat> has some friends that they get him out of there and uh, they, uh, they take him uh, north uh, to Caesarea and uh, further north then on to Tarsus, which was his hometown, you remember, Saul of Tarsus. Well, while he was there, I'm sure he was beginning to really be taught by the Holy Spirit about the things of Jesus. And, but now uh, he's at home in Tarsus and the passage in chapter 9 suddenly turns to a man named Peter. So, uh, in the latter part of Acts chapter 9, Peter surfaces again, and he heals a person named Aeneas. He was a paralytic. I don't know if maybe he had had a stroke. I, I didn't say. He just said he, is, he had been paralyzed for eight years. And, and through Simon Peter, God heals him. And it tells us in the ninth chapter, verse 35, that after this man was healed, now you imagine what kind of commotion that would cause. After this man was healed, it says, all who lived in Lydda 
and Sharon, the plain of Sharon, saw him, the crippled man, healed. They saw him and they turned to the Lord. So, upon hearing then of another situation, Paul left Lydda and went down to Joppa. Now, we're going to get there in a minute. Just bear with me. And another, he, there was a, a, a lady named Tabitha, you remember? And she had died. And so they beckoned Peter to leave Lydda and come down to Joppa. And it was there through Simon Peter that God raised Tabitha from the dead. You imagine what kind of commotion that caused. And in verse 9, uh, 42 of chapter 9, it says, And it became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So everywhere Simon went, God used him. Things were happening, and many, many people were turning to the Lord. Wonderful thing. So now here is Simon Peter, and he is in Joppa, and he is staying in the home of Simon the Tanner. We read that in verse 43 of chapter 9. Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. Now we've got to sort of pick up here the conflict that's going on because I, I talked about Jews and Gentiles. Peter's a Jew. He's a converted Jew. He's a believer in Jesus Christ. But he's still a Jew. And so in this whole story of chapter 10, there's the, there's the conflict. There's the, the problem in the heart and mind and the life of Simon Peter. So it seems ironic to me and really even unusual to me that he takes up abode in the home of a tanner <coughs> by the name of Simon. Now, the Jews regarded the trade of a tanner, a man who tan, tanned hides, to be unclean, hopelessly unclean, because they were forbidden to, to handle the skins of dead or unclean animals. That was forbidden in their law. But here's Simon Peter, the Jew, in the home of Simon the Tanner. Maybe he was a converted Jew. Maybe he was a, a, a follower of Christ. But nonetheless, Simon the Jew, who not yet got this idea about clean and unclean, staying in the home of Simon the Tanner. And he says he stayed there for many days. So it seems like maybe that Simon Peter the Jew and his Jewish legalism is beginning to soften up a little bit, maybe. Not sure. So here is Peter in Joppa. Saul is in Tarsus. And they're both beginning to get an education about being a Christ follower. Read with me in chapter 10 of the book of Acts. I'm going to start reading in verse 9. We'll go back a little sooner than in just a moment. On the next day, now he's in the home of Simon the, the tanner, and, and uh, let me begin there in verse 9. On the next day, as they were on their way, the men from 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 Caesarea were on their way. That's who he's talking about. Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, but then he got hungry. Now, I don't know if you go to sleep when you're hungry, you start dreaming about food. I, I don't know about that. I dream about food, I guess, sometimes. But he was hungry. And while they were making preparations, in other words, while they were fixing the meal, he fell into a trance 
and he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals, crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him and said, Simon, get up, kill and eat. Kill and eat. And his response was, by no means. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. There's his Jewish legalism. There's his Jewish religion. So three times Peter refused to do what the Lord told him to do. And he was confused. Look on down. Look on down and now. Verse 17, it says, Now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind, he was confused. He didn't really understand what was going on. He was about to become more educated than he ever had been. So, there he is. Now, let's go back a little bit to the beginning of chapter 10. We're introduced to a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman officer. Look there in verse 1. There was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. He was in charge of a hundred other soldiers. He was a devout man. And as we begin to read the description of Cornelius, it seems, seems to be ironic. You know, if you watch the the movies about Bible times and you see the Roman soldiers, they're always dressed in all this armor and they're always so mean and and beating everybody and being so bad. And, And then here's a guy who is a Roman officer. And it says he was a devout man. One who feared God with all his household gave many alms to the Jewish people. Out of his own pocket, he gave money to help the Jews. Don't seem like a Roman officer, does he? And he prayed to God continually. Good man. We'd all agree, would we not? He's a good man. He was a good man. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa. Remember, Cornelius is in Caesarea. Who's in Joppa? Simon Peter. Send some men down to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. The instructions were very clear. Now, we read chapter 9 of what was going on with Peter while all this was going on. While Cornelius was having this encounter with an angel, getting his men together and sending them down to Joppa, Peter's having an experience in Joppa when God is showing him all the animals of the world. So here we find a devout man, Cornelius. He had apparently accepted the Jewish belief in God. He prayed to God continually, it said. There was no God to pray to for the Roman, so undoubtedly he was praying to the Jews' God, the Jewish God. He worshipped in their synagogues, He would probably have been very attracted to their way of life. They were very ethical, very moral, 
very uh, family-centered and oriented. But nonetheless, he was attracted to something that had to do with Judaism. He would have known about their teachings because the Old Testament in Greek, of course, would have been read in the synagogues that Cornelius would have attended. <clears throat> so he would have heard the law read. And he prayed to God continually. He was a seeker. He was wanting to know more. No doubt within his heart there was a yearning for something more. His moral lifestyle, his ethical life, his giving to the poor, his, his uh, uh, fearing God and praying continually, but there was still something more. The heart of the seeker is never at peace until the void in his heart is filled with the grace and the love of Jesus. Now, if we were to describe Cornelius in just a few words, we would say Cornelius was a good man. Today I want us to think about barriers. Barriers to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Barriers that we have in our life, in our hearts, in our minds, that keep us away from God. Keep us away from a close, life-filled, living relationship with Jesus Christ. And there are a lot of them. There are lots of barriers. One of the barriers that a lot of people hold up that keep them from trusting Christ as their Savior is that they are good people. Good people. Honest people. Good family members. Good husbands. Good wives. Obedient and respectful children. Pay their debts. Work hard. Honest, people of integrity and people of character. But they're still lost people. They're good people, but they're not saved people. And so often, good people do not understand their need of a Savior. I'm good, I'm honest, I'm upright. What else do I need? Why would I need anything that you have to offer when life's pretty doggone good and I'm a good person? Many good people do not understand their need of a Savior. Some have their eyes on compromising Christians. They say, well, if that's, that's what being a Christian is, I don't want to know. I'm better than they are. The thing I see them doing and the things I hear them saying and their attitudes and their, the, 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 the frequency, the places they free. If that's a Christian, no. Because I'm better than they are. You see, that's a barrier. That's a barrier. God help anybody in this place that may be a compromising Christian. Because you're not only relinquishing the joy and the peace of living for Jesus, you're keeping other people from getting saved. Because the world watches us. So for some good people, that being good is a barrier to them. Being good is not enough. Being moral and ethical will never save you. Only your personal faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone will save you and give you the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. God sent an angel to Cornelius telling him to go send somebody to go get Peter. Now, we said there's two people here, in the, two central people in this whole story. Cornelius, the Roman officer, and Simon Peter, the disciple of Jesus Christ. 
Cornelius, a Gentile, Peter, a Jew, a converted Jew, a Christian Jew, but he's still a Jew. So Peter, being a Jew, was very knowledgeable about the dietary laws that, and you can read them for yourselves, they're in the 11th chapter of Leviticus. And there's a whole list of things that a Jew could not eat. I, I jotted down just a few of them. A Jew was not to eat the meat of a camel or a rabbit or a pig. Nothing from the water that does not have fins and scales. That's hard on people like catfish. They, almost all the birds were prohibited. They could not eat mice, moles, lizards, crocodile, and nothing that crawls on its belly. <laughs> Bless his heart when that thing came down out of heaven. And Peter looked in there, man. There were all kinds. There was everything. There were probably even some lizards in there, things that he was not supposed to eat. That's what he was saying. Lord, I've never eaten any of this stuff because my Jewish law says I must not because they are unclean. Now, there were some things Peter could eat. The law would allow him to eat grasshoppers and locusts. And any animal that had a completely divided hoof and chew the cud. He could eat that. So in Acts chapter 10, look there in verse 17. It says that when Peter saw this, he was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be. And the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who is also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting, he was still trying to figure out what's going on. While Peter was reflecting on this, on the vision, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit said, three men are looking for you. Get up, go down stairs, stairs accompany them without any misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Now, look on down in verse 23. And on the next day, the men had come. They had been brought in, stayed overnight. On the next day, he, Simon, he got up and went away with them. And some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, there were actually six, it says later, that there were six Jewish Christians in Joppa that went with Simon. Now we're going to look at that a little closer in just a moment. When Peter entered, now they're, they're, they're at uh, Caesarea, verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. Peter said, get up, I'm just a man just like you are. And as he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. Cornelius had brought a crowd. Sound like a good place to take an offering. Verse 28, and he said to them, in explanation, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. To the Jewish Peter and to the Jewish people, Cornelius, a Gentile, a Roman, was unclean and not to be associated with. I read many years ago, and I may be wrong in, in citing this, but I believe it was Josephus, the Jewish historian, that wrote in among his writings that the only thing that a Gentile was good for was to be uh, uh, skewered on a pole dipped in tar, set on fire, and to light the gates of hell. So they didn't have a lot of good opinion about Gentiles. 
So Simon is explaining to them so they'll understand the problem here. Now, there was no Mosaic law about a Jew entering a Gentile's home, but it had become part of the traditional oral law that a Jew was not to enter the home of a Gentile. Now, this is the same Peter. Let me remind you, this is the same Peter in Matthew 15 that told Jesus to send away a Gentile woman who was sick and needed help. And he said, send her away. We don't have time for her. This is the same Peter. And I don't mean to be unkind in what I'm about to say, but when you look at Simon Peter, on the rooftop as the vision is given and he sees all of this, I've never eaten anything unclean. Uh, Simon Peter was a religious bigot. Prejudiced. He was filled with religious prejudice. And because of his religion, he hated other people. But God was changing his heart. The Spirit of God was doing a work in his heart. To make him understand, God does not show partiality. This thing of Jew and Gentile is out of your tradition. It is not the heart of God. Because God has created all men equally. He does not see Jew and Gentile. Because of the intervention of the, the cross of Jesus Christ. There's only two kinds of people. Not Jew and Gentile, but lost and saved. And here is Simon Peter, having experienced the new birth, having been born again, a follower of Jesus Christ, willing to enter in, willing to lay aside his Jewish tradition. But beloved, there are a lot of people today in whose heart their religion is a barrier to them coming to know Jesus. Very religious, very spiritual, but very lost. Faye and I had the privilege of serving on the foreign mission field for a time, serving among Hindus and Muslims. The main theme of both of them was what they could do what they could do to appease their God or to satisfy their God or to make their God happy, how they could approach their God. It was all about what they could do. And beloved, praise God today that our relationship with Him is not based upon what we do, but upon what Jesus did. And through our personal faith in Him, we don't approach Him. He comes to us. He has come to man through the man Jesus. God has come to us in the fullness of time, Paul said. In the fullness of time when it was just right, God sent forth His Son, born of a virgin, lived a perfect sinless life, died on a cross shedding innocent blood so that your sins and my sins could be forgiven, buried in a barred tomb, resurrected the third day. And then I love that in Hebrews where it says that Jesus took His blood, not the blood of calves and bulls, not the blood of an animal, but with His own blood, He entered into the Holy of Holies in heaven, and there He obtained eternal redemption once and for all. Religion can blind us to the grace of God. Religion that I'm talking about is very legalistic, very law-driven. And again, just like the Hindu, just like the Muslim, religion that I'm talking about is all based on works. It's all in what you do. Now, the good man hides behind the same barrier. That my good doing should make God happy with me. 
My good activity should make God pleased with me. I'm a good person. Or I'm a religious person. I do this and I do that. I do this and I do that. I don't do this and I don't do that. I don't do this and I don't do that. But I do this and I do that. It's all about doing. If I'm not mistaken, that last song Joey led us in talked a lot about trusting him. Trusting Him. You see, it's not about our doing. Because when Jesus changes our heart, then that changes what we do. He changes who I am. And then that changes what I do. Our religion will often keep us from witnessing to the unsaved. It will often prohibit us from demonstrating a Christ-like love and concern for others. Especially others who are not like us or who don't believe like us. Or who have no belief at all. Barrier. What we're reading about in the 10th chapter of Acts is the first time, the first time that a Christian was facing a Gentile audience with the message of Christ. And that's what broke the barrier down. Verse 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. I finally come to understand that. He was growing in his understanding of what it meant to be a follower of Christ. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth. That's his message. Jesus. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all these things. All the things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But praise God, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. We saw him. Beloved, the thing that broke down the barrier of being a good person, the barrier of legalistic religion, was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the message of love. It is the message of forgiveness. It is the message of grace. Grace given to us. Well, what happened? While Peter, verse 44, while Peter was still preaching these words, preaching his message, he got interrupted. The Holy Spirit fell on all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter from Joppa were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Barriers being broken. Barriers being destroyed. What kind of barrier is there in your life? The only one who can break it down is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you know him, you come to understand that God is not a God who shows partiality. All, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none good, no, not one. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that if you would believe in him, you would not perish, but have everlasting life. 
barriers keeping people from walking with Jesus, knowing him as the Lord of their life. Good people, good people, maybe even good and religious people, but lost. Pray with me. Father, thank you today for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for men like Simon Peter who came to understand that their legalistic religion was basically worthless. And the only hope, the only peace, the only answer he could give that Gentile Roman officer, the only word he could say to him is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. Trust in Him. Believe in Him. Oh, it was a high holy day that day in Cornelius' home. People getting saved. People getting baptized. Woo! Love to have been there. Barriers were broken down through the message of love and grace. And Father, I pray for those in this room today who still there's some barriers there. Maybe they're very good, very kind, very honest. Maybe even better than some Christians they know. But they're still lost. That barrier's still there. I pray that today through faith in Jesus they'll find that barrier destroyed. And they'll come to know you as their Savior, the Lord. Father, for that one in this room that may be very, very religious. Thumbs under their armpit, reared back, talking about how holy and how righteous they are. How much they know about the Bible. How many years of perfect attendance at church. And they're lost as a goose. And their religion is a barrier. Surely God is pleased with me. Father, your word tells us that the only way you see us is through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. So Father, draw those today that need to be saved, those that need to get down to business about being saved. Maybe somebody here, Lord, that's <clears throat> they've been saved, but they've never been baptized. Or, or maybe they got baptized before they got saved and their baptism is on the wrong side of their salvation. So Father, may your will be done in every heart and every life in this room, I pray in Jesus' name.